right, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for taking some time this afternoon to join us for this containers in depth session. I'll be your presenter today, Brent Laster. And so we're going to jump right into this. Uh, we're going to talk today about how containers work and kind of the storage drivers and how they're put together. For some of you who may have been in my uh, previous workshop here, uh, some of this may be familiar, but you'll get some new stuff out of it as well. Let me go ahead and share my screen here and jump into the presentation, get that going. So in here, we're about, a little bit about me very briefly. My day job is an R&D director in a technology company here in North Carolina. Uh, I do a bit of global training. Got some books out there. Uh, there's information and connect with me on social media. Twitter handle is also at the bottom of the, the slides here. If you're interested in hearing about any other of my uh, workshops or things that I do on uh, O'Reilly or other platforms, uh, just connect with me on Twitter and I, I usually post what's coming up there. We have, uh, whoops, we have jumping to my LinkedIn there. Sorry about that. Let's go back to my presentation here it jumped jumped me to that you guys didn't have to didn't see that but it would take my linkedin location so books out there professional get uh good for advanced or new people to get if you're interested in that check it out on amazon uh jenkins tube book if you're interested in jenkins up and running to being writing your pipelines as code if you know jenkins check that one out as well um useful probably to get the electronic version of that as the screenshots are kind of washed out in some of the uh some of the print printed versions of that. All right, so jumping into our topics for the next 45 minutes. Uh, our agenda, what containers are, the benefits they provide, how containers are constructed. We'll talk about the differences between layers, images, and containers, what makes them up, how they all relate. What does immutability really mean? The core Linux functionality containers are based on, how containers reuse code, and we'll get in more detail to one line here, but it belies uh, quite a bit of detail we go into with storage drivers and particularly the overlay to storage driver, the most uh, common default storage driver today. And towards the end about the, we'll talk about the open container initiative. So what are containers? Again, some of you who've been through the workshops may have seen this slide before. Essentially you can think of containers as being like a standard way of packaging up software, a standard unit of software, much where your application uh, feels like it has its own system to run on and that's the idea much like if you had your own laptop with everything provisioned on it you can have things in a container like the app the runtime the dependencies the settings the system libraries all the things the environment provisioned and configured in that container um, that you need to run your app so you can focus on running your app in there but a container isn't a vm it's leverages several features of the linux operating system to carve out a self-contained space to run in, uh, as opposed to a virtual machine where you are actually having to have some other thing like a virtual box or something as a hypervisor program to host that virtual machine running on there. You instead can just have Docker installed and Docker is able to carve out or grab portions of the resources of the system to be able to give that container its own environment. We'll talk about a little bit more about that later on. So containers are running instances of images. Images uh, define what goes into a container and containers are built up from images. Benefits of a container, uh, very briefly, since they're self-contained, they're, e they're easy to start up and spin up. It's as if, again, somebody brought like a laptop or something with them and just opened it up and fired up the application is ready to go because it's all installed, configured, ready to run through that. Uh, it also lends itself well to applications like uh, having microservices, these smaller services that define your app and running uh, lots of microservices, running them as individual containers. You don't have to worry about trying to provision the systems every time for each instance or how many are running on there. You have their, they all have their own individual environment and such on there. So it makes it easier to have that sort of uh, separation in there and to be ported across anything that can be run on anything that runs Docker. <clears throat> A container image is a read-only template used to create a container. Images are kind of like a snapshot of a container. I tell people, think of it as if you were provisioning a machine. If you were installing software on a machine, you would go through and install all the software on there, and then you have an image that you can work with. You can provision other machines from it in there. The same idea. 
I can, images are stored in a registry, which is like a repository for images, and they're considered to be immutable, that if you want to change something on them, you would create a new version of the image. You wouldn't change something in the existing image, you would create a new version of the image. And that's important for reasons we'll see in just a moment. The Docker build command is used to create these, to create an image from a Docker file. So a Docker image is built up from a series of layers. Each layer results from an instruction in a Docker file. Uh, when we have a Docker file, think of that as the recipe or the script, the set of instructions for how to create the image. In other words, I start with a basic operating system. I may copy some things from locally from my operating system in there. I may run some things to set up the environment or do configuration, get some things the way I want it. It's similar again to this idea of provisioning a new computer. How do I get it all set up the way that I want it so that I can then use it? And as we do this, certain uh, instructions will create new layers in the, doc or in the image. The layers get stacked on top of each other and each layer is only the set of differences from the one before. <clears throat> These layers are all read only, except for when we run a container, we add one additional layer, which is a read write layer. Think of it in the same way as we provision a uh, computer, then we actually create a user area where we can read and write and store information that is particular to that user or that instance. In the same way, when we create a container from an image, we put a layer on top of it that we can read and write and use in there, but we don't touch any of the other lower layers because they are read only there. So a container is just an image plus this thin read write layer spun up for us to use. All changes that are made to the running container go in that read write layer. Now I won't go through, uh, we'll see an example here. Basically this is just an example of doing a Docker build to pull down information, uh, to pull to build a, get an image locally for us. What it's doing in this context is going through each step in this Docker file and executing. In the first case, it's saying get stuff from this MySQL image that's out there, a version 5.5.45, and it's pulling down the layers that were used to build that image. So we can start our existing images with other images, and those images in turn will be ba based on other images or based on layers themselves. So all the layers, all the commands that went into making these layers and setting up the environment and uh, provisioning this area of the software for this MySQL image are getting pulled down in this first step here. And actually after it's done, then we'll go ahead and we'll start building our image by adding layers on top of that. We'll be copying stuff over from our local area. We'll be setting an entry point where we enter and start executing things for our container and also running the MySQL daemon out there. <clears throat> So as you can see, even though the step one was just one step, it brought down a bunch of layers that made up that base image for us that somebody else had put together and put out there to set up a MySQL environment. Now, if we were to map this through to from the Docker file from running the steps, we could also do a Docker history. A Docker history would allow us to see all of the layers that went into building up this image. The ones that are marked as missing there simply means that the layers were built on a different system and so we don't have them available locally, but we can still see the pieces that went into it. So you can see that these steps that we went through provisioning this image, creating it, all went into layers that then built up here. And we have just gone through, and as we execute the steps of the Docker file, we built up the layers of our own image here. And so each one of the steps in the Docker file in this case caused a instruction to happen to copy something to bring down an image or add something or spin something up, which then ultimately creates our image here. So our image here then is a read-only basis to form a container. In terms of oper intersecting with the operating system, system, we can think of layers as basically being like files to the operating system. The image layers are read only, immutable, but we create a container again by doing something like a Docker run, if you're using Docker, there are other applications you can use, but using Docker run to actually say spin up a container which puts a read write layer on top of there that we can then make changes to. So we have to use some operating system constructs here or some techniques to be able to make this all work. <clears throat> 
For example, to be able to find files throughout the layers here, we have the union file system. There are other approaches to this, but the union file system is the most common one you'll see used. And the union file system simply means that we can search through here. And if we need to find a file, we look kind of drill down through the different layers that make up our image until we find the file that we want. It essentially allows us to stack these layers on top of each other and present it as one kind of unified directory out there, being able to look down through it. So the union file system is one aspect of that. Another thing though that comes into play here though is what happens if I need to actually change a file or modify a file? We've said that the image layers themselves below the container layer are read only. So if they are read only, how do we change files? Well, what happens if we use a technique called copy on write that this provided for us or cal? So essentially when we want to modify a file in the local layers, we simply bring a copy of it up to the upper layer, to container layer, and then from there we can make a copy of it there. And because the union file system allows us to look from the top down, we see that copy that we've made first, and so we don't see the lower one. So that kind of unified presentation of those layers together allows us to change things at the top level, the container layer, without having to modify things on at the lower layers. You can kind of also think of it maybe like a path environment variable. If you've ever looked at the path environment variable on your system, you know, the idea is we have the components of the path and we start at one. If we don't find something there, we look through to the next directory in it. And we find some look there. If we don't find it there, we're through the next directory. Kind of the same idea in going through the layers. Other Linux app facilities like things called C groups and namespaces, which we'll talk about more in a moment, keep our containers separate. The nice thing about this sort of arrangement is that our containers then can have, we can have multiple containers based on the same image. It's very simple then because the containers are only a read-write layer that points to the lower image. The image stays the same, read-only, immutable, across all the containers, but we can have multiple containers layers still pointing and using the image. They can use that union file system to get the file and the functionality and things that are set up in there. So even if we multiple containers can share access to the same underlying image, and it simplifies rebuilding things as well, because we only have to have new layers if something's changed appropriate to that or something's changed that needs to be updated in there. It also means that when we go to pull images out from a Docker repository or a Docker registry, we don't have to re-pull layers that we already have. The layers are stored on the file system in var live Docker. We'll talk more about that uh, in just a few moments, kind of get into more detail on that. But essentially Docker uses storage drivers then to manage the contents of the image layers and the writable layer. So Docker itself, uh, there's kind of the, the public thing, which is simply it's a distributed application for or an open platform distributed applications for developers and sysadmin. What Docker really is, it was the first application to really wrap around the underlying Linux container technologies. Linux has had containerizing technologies called LXC for a long time. And Docker was the, one of the main ones or the, the, the uh, probably the first or best ones to put these wrappers around it, wrappers in terms of a REST interface that we could call into to do things, a description format for containers, an API for orchestrating things out there. It kind of put a nice formal package around it that was easier to use and manage containers. Um, <clears throat> as we said, it's really just leveraging three of these functionalities from Linux, the union file system, the namespaces, and the C groups. We saw what the union file system was already. So we know that kind of allows us to drill down. C groups simply are uh, processes for the purpose of system resource management. So we're simply kind of, uh, leveraging these to share system resources among containers. Resources we're interested in would be things like CPU, memory, IO, networking. And you can think of a C group as grabbing a part of this or grabbing a section of this for a particular container out there, getting a section of the CPU, the memory, the IO, the network for to use. So it allows us to track, isolate, and limit resource usage for a set of processes. And that's what we need to run the app in our container. We need it to have its own share of those resources. We talk about namespaces. They provide isolated instance of a global resource out here, such as a separate instances of, it appears as a separate instance of these kinds of things within the namespace. So we have ones for process IDs, allow processes in different containers to have the same process ID. We have ones for networking, networking interfaces. 
to provide isolation of networking controllers, system resource associated with networking. The idea again of carving out portions of this for a container to work with, a mount point isolates a set of file system mount points seen by a group of processes. So they have different views of the system hierarchy. For example, each container can have its own temp or var directory. IPC, inter process communication in there, means that two containers can create shared memory segments and semaphores the same name, but not able to interact. Again, this kind of partitioning off or separating out of these kinds of resources. The user area, and also the UTS or Unix time sharing services in there, allows each container to have its own host name and NIS domain name. So again, the overall theme of this idea of carving out system resources and portions of it for containers to use. <clears throat> we talk about a Docker file as being the set of instructions that we want to use or tells us how to create the image from that. We see some examples here, it has a format in there. When we talk about chain, taking a Docker file, creating an image to a container, we essentially take the Docker file, the set of instructions, run a Docker build command through it. It executes the instructions, pulling down any layers that we need, any pieces, and then we can run it to produce that container, which again, just has that read writable layer on it. So that's the kind of overall flow. Docker commands, lots of commands out here to build, to build images, to look at the images, remove images, pull things out of repositories and so on. So how do we think about all this? Well, I've alluded to it already. Think about the analogy of installing software on a machine then provisioning systems for users. If we have a system and we install we layers of software on the disk, for example, the operating system, applications, maybe antivirus, we have provisioned a disk image. We created an image that has all the software provisioned and ready to use. We could then take that and we could recreate it on a system by starting it by making a copy of that image or using that image. And we could do it on another one as well. Now, when we talk about provisioning a machine, a lot of times we set up the final thing we do is setting up the user space, the user space where they write files, change files, and so on. And then that simulates the kind of container layer out there, the read write layer. But we could also take that image, again, existing image, and build another PC off of it with another user area out there. So you might think of this image as kind of being like a Docker image that has that provisioned set of software configured and set up as we need it that we can use a basis. And you might think of the container as being that system that then has the user area or the area we can read and write and things on top of that. So if that's a useful analogy, uh, feel free to adopt it. Let's dive a little bit deeper into talking about layers because that's really key to understanding more of how Docker works and how containers work. Containers can reuse layers, as we mentioned. So if they already exist in a Docker file structure. So when we bring something down, we pull an image, we get a set of layers down, the layers that went into making that image. If those layers happen to be used by another uh, application, we can actually do, a, when we do a Docker pull, uh, here we'll see that the layer can already exist. So Docker is taking these layers, storing them out in the file system, and then if they need to be accessed, if it already has it, then it can just use the same layer again because the image is read-only and the, the uh, container is just a read right on top of that. Now, before Docker version 1.10, when we actually looked at the layers and the names of them and what was stored in the file system, it was pretty much a one-to-one -one definition. In fact, what a layer is, is simply a delta or a diff that results when commands are running. So when I run a command, it's think of it almost like a separate directory over here that just has the changes that I executed in that step. And then Docker is keeping track of those directories as what we call layers in there. You'll see the diff or what's changed, what was done differently in that. Then prior to Docker 1.10, the images and layers were synonymous. What I mean by that is if I looked at the list of layers in an image, I would see the same sort of thing out in the file system with the same names. I would see the same set of pieces out there. If I were to look at it with the Docker inspect to see it, I'd see the same things. But after 1.10, they went moved to a, what's called a content addressable thing. The idea here was that having those kind of one-to-one -one things was a little bit of a security risk. It had challenges with how to tell if the image had been tampered with during push-pull. So the a new approach, another problems, but the new approach is called content addressable IDs, which is simply a fancy way of saying we have a different way of naming our layers. 
layers don't have any affiliation or notion of an image. If you look at what's in an image in there, you have uh, you would have information about the SHA-256 in there. Layers are identified by the digest of the form algorithm hex value. All that means is we're using a hash. We're using a hash here. The hex value is the string computed from applying an algorithm to the layer's contents. We hash the contents of that. Remember that I said that what's in a layer is the difference between what was done between that and the previous layer. If I added a file, if I did a, some other configuration, that's stored in that directory that represents that layer. We can then run a checksum or a hash computation against that. There are different hash kinds of algorithms, but what we're using right now is called SHA-256, Secure Hashing Algorithm 1, or Secure Hashing Algorithm 256. If you've ever heard of an MD5 checksum, it's a beyond that, but the same idea. We do a checksum across the layer's contents, and then the SHA-256, and then the checksum becomes an identifier in there uh, for that particular layer. So if we were to do a Docker inspect now, what we would see is this sort of digest representation in the layer section of the output of Docker inspect, the SHA-256 and then the digest of that. Because we have that checksum now that's computed, it's very easy to see if something changed or been tampered with or such, as opposed to just the same identifier that we had before. So a Docker image also has a configuration object, which includes the list of layer digest. And the actual overall image ID is the computed hash of that configuration object. So that configuration object to list all the pieces, they run a hash on that, and that becomes the ID of the image itself. If you want to know more about what Docker is doing, kind of like where it's storing things, what algorithm and such it's using, you can look at Docker info. And there'll be two pieces of information in there, in this case, that we're particularly interested in. The storage driver, whoops, sorry, a storage driver, which is we'll get into more a little bit, called Overlay2, uh, in this case, the Overlay2 storage driver, it's one of several that are available. And then notice down here, we have the Docker root directory, which says, where does it store the layers? Where does it do its work? Var Live Docker is going to be pretty much the place in everything, unless you specifically do something to change it. Even on the Mac in there and on Windows, you're typically using a virtual machine of some kind in there that's running and has a root into Var Live Docker inside of the virtual machine. There are multiple approaches on Windows though. You could have native Windows container, or you could do Linux containers, which would do again a Hyper-V, a virtualization mechanism uh, in there, which uses the allocation like the Var Live Docker. Now the root folder, if you were to look out there what's under it, you would see lots of subfolders, things like containers, images, network, uh, overlay to plugins, all this. We don't have time in this to go into all of it, but you can explore more if you're interested in this. You can get an idea of all the kinds of things that it's tracking. Docker is tracking to keep up with how we put layers and images and containers together and how we keep track of them. Storage drivers, also known uh, traditionally kind of as graph drivers in there because uh, the it kind of creates an image graph of this. It's a local instance of a Docker engine, their local instance Docker engine has a cache of image layers. As we pull down, these are done by from Docker pool, Docker build, etc. It brings down these layers. They're stored out there in var live Docker for images to combine together to create images and to use in containers. But we need a driver to manage all of these and to manage how they're put together, how it looks, how it uses that kind of union file system. Uh, or other methods to kind of layer these things together. So we need to have this driver to mount the layers into this consolidated root file system. So we can get that unified view of these things stacked on each other. And it creates a kind of an image graph. If you think about it kind of weaving through the different layers. So these were also called uh, graph drivers in time past. Some storage driver examples very quickly here. The main ones, AUFS, another union file system, are also called uh, just union file system. Um, this is the oldest and most mature one. It's been around for a long time. And prior to Overlay and Overlay 2, it was the one that was used. It primarily worked on, or was used on uh, certain Debian uh, Linux distros out there. Um, it's fast to start up, efficient resources, but it hasn't ever really been fully accepted, never really merged into the main line Linux there. But it's still around quite a bit, especially if you're using, I think it's before like a, a Ubuntu 18.06, some particular versions of the older systems out there. 
Uh, there's one called BTRF. This one is a B tree file system. This one's a little different. It doesn't really use the whole uh, traditional union file system and stuff. It uses what's called snapshots, being able to take snapshots of the file system at a point in time. This is one where the driver is really utilizing the uh, operating systems uh, or file systems uh, functionality rather than things that sit on top of the file system. So it has performance impact, higher memory usage, considered kind of buggy. Uh, just mentioned here, the one at the bottom, I got these in alphabetical order, but ZFS, similar kind of thing, uses snapshots out there to manage things. Interesting one called Device Mapper. <clears throat> Device mapper operates on storage blocks or disk blocks out there at the, the block level. Uh, and so it kind of manages the blocks rather than files. It's not file-based. Uh, it's former default for Syntax, CentOS and Red Hat Linux before Overlay 2. Overlay and Overlay 2 are use the overlay file system of kernel extension. Basically, we'll talk more about Overlay 2 in a few moments, we'll go into it. These are faster, simpler than AUFS. Uh, the challenge with overlay, why there's an overlay too, overlay uh, it caused conditions where it ran out of inodes, operating system. An inode is a thing uh, that contains metadata for each file on a system, and the count of the inodes is hard coded in the operating system. So because of the way overlay two was done, it was good, but it would eventually have problems with inodes. So they invented overlay two, which is a little nicer with that. And finally, there's one called VFS, which you probably will never hear of, but it's a simple approach uh, for kind of more developing Docker dev and testing. It simply makes copies of everything. It doesn't leverage uh, the same images out there. It simply makes a copy. Whenever something needs change, doesn't do the copy on write. It simply makes another copy of the layer. So it's not very useful in most respects, but it, uh, you know, it's kind of the brute force method there, useful for developing sometimes Docker itself. Storage driver tech, we've alluded to these. The union file system is an overlay, combines multiple mount points into one, kind of layers things together in there. Snapshots are used by the file systems uh, like the BTRF and ZFS. They do a point in time copy of things. They're created create quickly, but consume more space over time. And then the odd one device mapper, which actually uses uh, mapping physical blocks on the disk, the higher level virtual blocks, which ends up kind of uh, being a waste of some space because it tends to allocate blocks and it carries kind of sparse files out there. Uh, looking at the AUFS model, I'll just go through these very quickly again, Otis, but most, Mature. If you look on these diagrams, this is the Docker concepts on the right, the image and base layers, the container layer. On the, the, on the left, rather, on the right is the particular file drivers uh, concepts, the AUFS. AUFS uses something called branches, but it's essentially the same idea. We find the files where they exist down there. We have a container level where we have a mount point. <clears throat> if we delete something, it actually puts uh, what's called a whiteout file in there or if it's a directory opaque, it puts a block in there so that you don't see the lower one. Essentially, it's a special file to indicate that the it obscures the view down lower to it. Overlay model has a single lower overlay. When we talk about overlay, we talk about uh, essentially a lower directory, an upper directory, and a merge directory. Now you think about, you say, well, how can I only have three layers in there? Well, the way this works with overlay is the merged area, again, is the, the kind of common view into it. Upper dir is kind of like our uh, container layer where we make changes and stuff. Then lower dir is everything else. But the overlay kernel piece there combines these three together. But since there's only three, what they had to do was they had to basically do what's called links, hard links of directories into this lower dir. So this lower dir area here, this layer, gets hard linked out to a bunch of others which make up the layers. And you can start to think about if I'm doing a bunch of hard links on the operating system, that uses up those I nodes and starts to get very messy over time. <clears throat> so this was the overlay implementation. Overlay two, which we'll talk about a little bit more detail here in the last part of the session, uh, fixed some of the problems by having support for this lower directory to essentially have up to 128 layers or to know about 128 layers. It uses shorter links to connect into that. But the essential idea is kind of the same. We have an upper directory, 
our, and we have the container layer, we have a lower layer here, a couple lower layers, and then we can have up to 128 uh, layers here that it knows how to natively manage. They're not hard linked in, they're sim linked in, they have links back to it. So essentially uses like 100, has support for up to 128. If you ever really have gotten very big with Docker and trying to, and hitting that, you may have hit that 128 limits depending on the version you were use, 128 layers. And again, if we have something that blocks out the file, delete a file, we just put a whiteout file there uh, in place of it. Device mapper is the one we mentioned that uses the blocks on the device, the blocks on disk there to manage it. It takes blocks from different layers there, from different snapshots, these point in time copies of things and uses them to manage. And then the BTRF or the BTree file system or the ZFS model uses snapshots out there to implement the layers instead of a directory. So you're looking through snapshots, but same kind of ideas, different sub volumes, snapshots out there. All right, so for the last part of the session, let's dive a little deeper into Overlay 2. Overlay 2 has become now the favorite or the default uh, storage driver that's used in newer versions of Docker because it gets it is faster than others, uh, better performance in general, and does not suffer from the inode problem that we talked about with Overlay. So when we talk about Overlay file system directories, we mentioned that we have lower dir, which is our read-only image layers, all the layers except for that upper level one. Then we have what's called upper dir. These are just little uh, terms here. <clears throat> read write layer where changes are written. This is like our container layer. Then we have the merge dir. If we think about these as directories out there, a merge view of all the layers. Uh, now, when you look at the lower dir, that's all the layers in that lower part of the image there. They'll be listed out by separated by colon from the topmost to the bottommost. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. The working drawer is just used specifically by the underlying Linux uh, extension here for the Linux overlay file system. And you could actually, just to kind of give you a reference point, if you were working in Linux, you could actually use overlay, the overlay FS, outside of Docker itself. For example, I could do a mount and mount in an overlay directory, uh, specify a different directory, a physical directory called base for the lower dir, a directory called diff for the upper dir, and so forth. And I can actually then create my own, my own overlay model. Overlay here meaning just stacking those together and being able to look through them. So you could actually do that, and then you can make changes in the upper dir and see it kind of block files through that or find files lower. So all kinds of, you can actually implement this yourself with a command like this using the overlay uh, mount type here. That's really what Docker is doing. It's using that overlay mount or the overlay type there to be able to connect up these directories, stack them on top and provide a unified view. So when we pull an image, we get different layers down. Like if we pull the Ubuntu image, if we were to look at inspecting that image that we got down, and using this JQ here to look at the, the uh, to pick out particular portions of the output, we could see the layers here. You would see we had three layers here. We have three layers here. Now notice again, this is not a one-to-one -one mapping because of what we talked about before. We have the digest here, which is simply the algorithm that was used for the checksum and the checksum itself. If I were then to do an, if I do a Docker inspect and look at a little different section, you'll see that we can see what under graph driver data, we see the actual directories under the var live Docker area that are associated with this. So we have lower dir, merge dir, upper dir, and work dir. Now remember that lower dir, even though it's called lower directory, it can have multiple directories. You can see here, if you look carefully on the lower dir, that after this last diff, diff being the directory where changes are stored as you make changes in a layer, we have a colon and then we have another one. So we can have up to 128, practically probably it's 125 because of some limitations, but we have up to 128 or so of these directories that are all uh, hooked together, kind of like a path variable in your operating system. You start in one place, look for a file. If it doesn't find that, go to the next location in the path, look for that does if I there go to next location and so on. So think of this as kind of a set of directories arranged as a path here. 
the merge dir and upper dir in this case are the same where we're going to make changes, write changes, and then the working directory is for internal use with overlay. So what's out there in the overlay two directory? A high level directory per layer. For example, if I were to look at overlay two based on those, those images that I just pulled, uh, they had three layers in it. I could see my three layers out here. This was the same thing I saw in the Docker inspect there, the lower dir, the upper dir, and the merge dir. You see in here are the directories for the image. You see in here the directories themselves. If I look down deeper into them, you'll also see, or in here, I'll see an L directory. L contains a shortened layer identifier, basically a shortened link. The reason we do that is to avoid that I know problem that overlay had. It's simply a way to connect to that. If I look at what's in the L directory, then you can see that it actually links back. This is just a shortened link to get to that longer directory and to the diff area. Diff is just simply that directory that's encompassing the changes made for a layer. <clears throat> so if we look at these different layers here, the lower directory, has a lowest layer. Again, a set of directories separated by a colon, order from highest to lowest. It contains a link to the main directory and the diff directory. So if we look at this, we have two directories listed here. If I look at what's in the one directory, this is in the overlay two, look at the lowest one, or look at, sorry, the um, one here, you'll see I have a diff and a link area, the lowest one. And here's a picture down here on the right hand side, the image base layer, lower directory two. The lowest one has a set of files in it. If I were to look at the diff, that would be the actual files that you would see in the container if you were able just to look at that layer. All, you know, ultimately this gets back to where are the files stored that go in the container? This is where they're stored. For this particular layer, it's a directory with looks like operating system, right? It has operating system files in it. So I look in the diff area there, I have a diff directory and I have a link area. If I look at the link, it's just a simple pointer back to that layer. So that's the lowest level. If I go one above <clears throat> layer number two, the first one in this lower directory list, I have a diff link, but I also have a lower directory and a work directory. Work is just where we do work if we need to, or where an overlay does. Lower is actually used to point to the previous layer. This is how they tie things together. If you look at the second block in the picture down here, the second lowest directory has a few changes in it. If I were to look at the diff area where file system changes are stored, I have a couple of changes I've made in here for Etsy user var. And then I have this lower, I have my own link for that layer. I have lower pointing back to the one below it. So then I have the pointer back. You can start to see how we can build up an image here. Finally, if I look at the upper directory <coughs> here, I can look at that and uh, you'll see that if I do an LS, I have a diff area to contain the changes made for that layer the link area to point back to the previous one, or the link area to point to this, le this uh, layer, and then the shortened version of it, and then the lower to point to the one before. If you look at what's in this directory, the only changes that were made through the Docker file process in here were to update something in the run directory. Now, if I look at what's in lower, lower is in the upper level, points back to the one before, which of course in the lower and the one after that points back to the other one. So you get the idea, just a bunch of pointers pointing in there and the diff directories, which are subdirectories here, contain the actual file changes. For example, in this case, the diff thing contained the run. Now, if I were to <clears throat> look at the Docker history for this particular image, what I would see is I would see a command in here that says make dir dash p run system d. So that was a command that was run at some point on this image and it created a layer. And so if I took the diff of the second layer, if I looked at that layer, guess what? If I go back to that upper directory and I did a diff, look at diff directory, there's the run, there's the system D. So you can see how a command in a Docker file gets translated into a layer, which is in essence a directory under there a larger directory for the layer, and then it has the subdirectory of the diff, 
with the changes in stored in there in the file. It ultimately all comes back to the file system. The changes are stored out there as directories, but they're just combined then <clears throat> with drivers through the things like the union mount and the file system there to build up the layers in, that we use in the containers. So what happens when we create a container? Well, if we use Docker run to start a container, we can actually, if we go in there and do a docker run dash it ubuntu. In fact, what this means is we're just going to have it run for a little bit, run ubuntu in there, start up, the, we get a shell, so it keeps running. If we look in overlay two, we'll see a new uh, layer in there, the B506 out there. So we see a new layer, that read write layer that got added for the container. If we create a new file, let's say that we're inside the container here, we create a new file, echo stuff greater than file one, and then we go and look at that. We'll look at the layer. The diff will have the file that we put in there. If we look at diff, we'll have file one, that file we just put. Because we just wrote it into that layer, which ultimately got translated back to this directory at the diff area on the file system. If we looked at the merged view, we would see the merged view, the kind of stacking in there. We would see the things coming from that lowest layer that we saw before, the all these kind of different areas of operating system, in, the things that came from the next lowest layer, and the the run that we had out there, and then the um, or the system. I'm not showing them all on here, but then we have the file that we just created, the file we just created, which is layer on top to give this unified view. So kind of cool, this is the way it all works together. You can start to see how the Docker file ultimately executes instructions. Those instructions get stored in this diff directory under there, if we create layers in there. The layers themselves have this, the overall subdirectories, uh, the larger ones in the overlay two area, have these files that point to links to the other layers. So it all gets connected together. And then Docker presents it as that sort of, uh, we call content addressable, which really just to check some of that out there. So by that, and there's the rest of it. So by that, you can see how this all stacks together. And really, it's not that mysterious once you understand that you have this area out there and you can figure out how to kind of decode what layers are what. And then you can look at that and find the actual file changes in there. The containers directory has a lot of other pieces in there. We talked about some of the configuration files, uh, host name, mounts, and so on uh, as well that you can look at in there. One more thing to mention very quickly here, the open container initiative. I said I would talk about that. So Docker was probably the first uh, application to really get into the place where it uh, uh, was able to put this interfaces and structure and APIs and stuff on top of containers, the Linux container technology. But now it's partnered with the Linux Foundation to create the Open Container Initiative, which simply is a way to say, we are standardizing all of these things, the structure, the interfaces, the APIs. If you implement this as an application, you can do the same things that Docker does. So there are other ones out there now, uh, things like Podman, Builda, uh, Cryo Rocket's been around for a long time, other ones that you may see that being used instead of Docker. Docker doesn't quite have the market share anymore, but just to be aware of, there are other applications out there that can do this. All right, I think we are uh, just a, maybe a minute or two ahead, but we are pretty much done at this point. So I know that was kind of a whirlwind tour, but I hope it was useful to you and I hope it was uh, interesting for you.